an extradition request um, to bring our loved one back to our country and around you know the support of, of community and colleagues and friends and especially the family tonight the native women's association of canada adds its voice to the calls to bring don walker home as she yes. remains in a u.s prison northerners and my you know myself included have noticed you know, an increase of um, people struggling with homelessness addiction and mental health in our community for Plus, a new report finds Indigenous people in Northern Ontario are struggling. I can't count how many times I would see games uh, designed by white people for white people with Native or First Nation or Indigenous representational themes strapped onto those games. And decolonizing tabletop role-playing games. Good evening, Tonse, and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. The Native Women's Association of Canada is joining the growing call for the return of Dawn Walker to Canada. The Saskatoon mother is being held in an Oregon jail on U.S. federal charges related to identity fraud and two more charges in Canada. APTN's Leanne Sanders has more. The Native Women's Association of Canada is calling on the federal government to negotiate the rapid return of Don Walker. The organization argues it's in the best interests of all concerned that she be allowed to quickly address the charges of parental abduction and public mischief that she faces in Saskatoon. Association President Carol McBride says the Walker case illustrates the frightening reality many Indigenous women face. Can you imagine? Um, what our sisters go through throughout this country. Um, you know, I mean, that horrible, horrible word, genocide. And that's what all these actions lead up to, genocide. The association cites the findings of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, which found that violence directed at Indigenous women in Canada is genocide, and that much of that violence is committed by domestic partners. Darlene Rose Okimasum Seacott with Women Walking Together in Saskatoon also said it's important that Walker be returned to the city as quickly as possible. An extradition request um, to bring our loved one back to our country and around you know the support of um, community and colleagues and friends and especially the family um, because we know what that experience is like in the judicial justice system. Both organizations are concerned that officials in the U.S. and Canada will not fully take into account the systemic circumstances involved when Indigenous women believe they're not safe. This is not a place, uh, a, a, a safe place to live as Indigenous women. That's that's the, the part I'm going on and that's the part that I'm going to fight for. Uh, you know, that the government starts moving on these calls for action. Dawn Walker said she fled Saskatoon because she feared for her and her son's safety. She and her son Vincent had been the subject of a week-long search when she was located in Oregon City. Vincent has been brought back to Canada and is with his father. Walker is scheduled to appear in an Oregon court on September 7th. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News. Saskatoon. Some sad news to report out of Saskatchewan today. RCMP say 74-year-old Lois Chartrand has been found dead about one kilometer from where she went missing. Chartrand was last seen on August 4th. She was picking mushrooms about 30 kilometers north of Smeaton. RCMP spoke with her by radio the following morning, but then lost contact with her. RCMP say she was found yesterday. RCMP thanked all the agencies and individuals that assisted in the search for Chartrand. They also thanked community members and Lois's loved ones who, despite the stressful circumstances, ensured all searchers were fed and supported. 
Iqaluit's long-standing water issues are bubbling to the surface again. This time, the culprit is not enough water in the reservoir, so the city has declared a local state of emergency to allow for more pumping from other bodies of water. Iqaluit will now increase the amount of water they currently are pumping from the Apex River and will begin to pump water from a nearby lake. The last time a local state of emergency emergency was called for. Water volume was in 2019, but since then, Iqaluit has rules to conserve city water. For example, you can't use it to wash a car. In April, the feds announced over $200 million in funding for Iqaluit to fix their many water problems. After a massive landslide devastated part of the Fraser River in B.C. in 2018, scientists, governments and First Nations have been working to help salmon pass through that portion of the river to their spawning grounds. Now, they say there's been big improvements. Sarah Connors explains. 280,000 salmon have passed through a sonar upstream of the site of the Big Bar landslide on the Fraser River. It's a number First Nations are celebrating. It's a positive experience whenever there's fish can, that can return to the spawning grounds. The Big Bar landslide took place in 2018 on the Fraser River near Lillooet, British Columbia. Debris from the slide created a five meter high waterfall, preventing sockeye and Chinook salmon from reaching their spawning grounds. After years of conservation efforts like trapping and transporting fish by truck past the slide site, the DFO says data shows the salmon appear to be making their way past the slide site to their spawning grounds. Upwards of 39,000 salmon are passing through the Big Bar area on a daily basis. So far, 741 fish have been radio tagged for monitoring. Officials say trilateral partnerships between governments and First Nations will be key in helping the salmon survive. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. A new report says homelessness, addictions and mental health issues are on the rise in northern Ontario. And all three are overwhelming, overwhelmingly excuse me, affecting Indigenous people. APTN's Fraser Needham reports. The report looks at data compiled in 2021 and shows the per capita rate of homelessness is three times as high in some northern communities such as Cochrane when compared to a major urban centre like Ottawa. Holly Parsons wrote the report for the Northern Policy Institute. Um, northerners and my, you know, myself included have noticed you know, an increase of um, people struggling with homelessness, addiction and mental health in our community, for me, in Sudbury. Um, so it was interesting to see that the data, in fact, matched that observation and that, um, you know, this is a kind of worsening crisis. And the numbers also show the majority of those experiencing the crisis are Indigenous. In the district of Kenora, 88% of their homeless population self-identify as Indigenous. And in fact, uh, there were uh, five northern districts that had over 60% of their homeless population self-identify as Indigenous. Other parts of the report show the direct correlation between homelessness, opioid addiction and mental health issues. It makes a number of recommendations, including the creation of a northern service hub, establishing a Northern Mental Health and Addiction Centre, and support for community housing facilities for Indigenous people. Parsons says it is key Northern people play an active role in designing this programming. We need something specific to Northern Ontario because service delivery looks so different up here um, and because one-size-fits-all policies don't normally work for Northern Ontario. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. We want to hear what you think about some of the stories you've seen so far tonight. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca or you can leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. All right, time for a short break, but still ahead, we'll chat with Team Canada lacrosse goalie Deacon Knott about the championship at the World Junior Lacrosse Championship this past weekend. We had high hopes coming into it, but we didn't really know how it was going to be 
uh, right off the bat, but it was it was an amazing, amazing time with all, all the boys and, and just an amazing tournament. Welcome back. An evacuation order is still in place for the Apex Mountain area in BC as crews continue to battle the Kirimios Creek wildfire. The BC Wildfire Service says crews are now battling the difficult part of the fire, which is quite active and hard to, hard to access. The fire is now estimated at 6,900 hectares. Officials are warning the northwest corner of the fire will remain out of control for some time. Saskatchewan's Health Authority is warning the public about an elevated risk of contracting monkeypox through anonymous sexual contact. The province's chief medical health officer says recent exposures to the virus happened through sexual contact with people coming into Saskatchewan. The, the exposure so far has been in men who have sex with men, but anyone who is a close contact is at risk. The province has expanded vaccine eligibility to anyone 18 years or older who's a close contact or deemed at higher risk. And health authorities in Quebec are launching another COVID-19 booster campaign. The focus is primarily on people living in private seniors' residences and long-term care homes. The recommended interval between a baseline vaccination and a booster is three months. That stretches to five months or more between subsequent booster shots. Quebec's public health director is also warning that COVID cases will likely increase this fall as kids return to school. The UK has become the first in the world to authorize the updated version of Moderna's COVID-19 booster. It targets both the original strain of the virus and the Omicron variant. The Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency says its decision was based on clinical trial data that shows a strong immune response against Omicron. British health officials have not yet decided whether or not the tweaked vaccine will be used in its fall strategy. Team Canada won the gold medal at the International Box Lacrosse Tournament last night against the Haudenosaunee team at the Canada Life Centre here in Winnipeg. Joining us now to talk about the win is Team Canada goalie Deacon Knott, who hails from a Curve Lake First Nation in Ontario. Welcome Deacon and congratulations on your win and also congratulations on being awarded the all-world goalie title as well. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to be here. So first off, how's it feel to have won the tournament? Oh, it's, it's amazing. I, um, we, we had high hopes coming into it, but we didn't really know how it was going to be uh, right off the bat. But it was, it was an amazing, amazing time with all, all the boys and, and just an amazing tournament. Now, you were up against some pretty stiff competition all tournament and faced 51 shots uh, in the final game. What was it like to play in the final against the Haudenosaunee team? Uh, it was really interesting. I, I played with a bunch of the guys on that team back home uh, a few times and played against them as well. But uh, I just kind of knew that I had to do my job and, and stand in there and, and do the best that I could do and, and be there for my team. Now, was it different playing against an Indigenous team who you know, brought the game to the rest of the world as opposed to some of the other teams? Uh, yeah, well, they're more developed uh, than a lot of teams, too, that we played against. And it was, um, it was a lot of stiff competition like, uh, like that we have back home in Ontario. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it was uh, a lot more challenging than, than a few teams that we have played against. Now, was there a team at the tournament that maybe surprised you at all or did better than you thought might have? Uh, Israel. Israel did uh, a lot better than, than kind of I think a lot of people thought and they, uh, they had a really good goaltender from, from back, uh, back home as well. He was my goalie partner in Peterborough but, uh, but Israel really surprised me on, on how they played. And what was it like just to play you know in a tournament like this again after you know such a long time layoff with COVID and all of that to have you know Poland and Israel and Haudenosaunee and just all those teams come together again for a tournament like this? Uh, it was really it was really cool um, like especially being in such a, a 
kind of well-known area and playing against a bunch of guys who, who I've played against and uh, a whole bunch of different teams all, all around the world, which is, which is really cool. And, and kind of getting laid off by COVID, uh, it's just really nice to be back and kind of back to normal and, and being with, with all your buddies again. Now, how did you get started in lacrosse? Um, I was just, well, I was actually a hockey goalie, and, uh, and they were looking for a goalie, and I figured I'd try it out. And I just ended up loving it and, and started to do, do well. And I uh, always loved the game, so I, I, I started there. And what should or I guess maybe could be done to spark the interest in the game amongst other Indigenous youth? Uh, just, I think just getting out there and really just trying it out and, and growing the, the love for the game because it's, it's an amazing game and, and everybody who tries it out has, uh, has something good to say about it. And what was your favorite part of the tournament? I'm sure you know winning was was up there, but was there something else maybe that you took, will take away from the whole experience? Winning was winning was amazing, but I think right whenever we we all kind of got together as a team, um, we all bonded super well, and a lot of us never even met each other or played with each other, and it was just amazing how how easily we clicked and, and bonded. And I think that was probably my my favorite. And what's next for you in terms of your lacrosse career and, and journey? I, uh, what's next is I, I still have uh, another year of junior left for, for box lacrosse, but I entered the, the NLL draft this year, and I'm, I'm hoping to get drafted in, in the next month or two. Well, best of luck to you there. Uh, well, we will have to leave it there, uh, unfortunately, but we really appreciate you coming in and speaking with us. And again, congratulations on all of your accolades and winning the tournament as well. Thank you very much. In hockey news, Team Canada will be looking to stay perfect in the World Juniors today as they get set to take on Finland. So far, Canada has a perfect record in the tournament, sweeping past Slovakia, Latvia and Czechia, but the Finns also come into the game undefeated. While both teams have already booked a trip to the quarterfinals, the winner will take top spots in the group. Puck drop is set for 6 p.m. Eastern. All right, time for one final break, but still to come. The game is focusing on more indigenous representation. I began to think, you know what? I think I actually have something to contribute here that hasn't been seen in this industry. And I wanted indigenous folks to feel a sense of optimism and hope in this game. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Nuka Bolt sent in a picture of her very first catch using a very traditional kakavak. She was along the shoreline of the beautiful Kukuruk Nunavut. Thanks for sharing, Nuka. You can send your pictures to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting over in East, 25 in Halifax and 24 in Rain in Charlottetown. 23 in Clear and Happy Valley Goose Bay and 20 in Cartwright. 28 in Montreal and 26 in Rain and Val d'Or. 27 in Showers in Windsor and 24 in North Bay. 27 in Clear in Wawa and 23 in Sun in Thunder Bay. 28 and rain in Churchill, and 28 and rain in Thompson, 26 and showers in Barron's River, and 27 in Dauphin, clear and 30 in Regina, and 27 in North Battleford, 29 and clear in Larange, and showers in 24 in Stony Rapids. As we move west to clear in 27 in Fort Chippewan, and showers in 24 in Peace River. 27 in Edmonton and 34 in Medicine Hat. 27 in Clear in Campbell River and 25 in Bella Coola. 18 in Rain and Sandspit and 26 in Fort Nelson. 19 in Whitehorse and 17 in Rock River. 24 in Showers in Norman Wells and 28 in Fort Simpson. 19 degrees in Colville Lake and 18 in Anuvik, 28 in Baker Lake, and 25 in Chesterfield, 
6 degrees in Arctic Bay and 10 degrees in Igloolik. For a growing number of people, TTRPGs, better known as tabletop role-playing games, are a fun and interesting way to spend your free time with your friends or family. Although for many indigenous players, representation is a tough thing to find in these spaces. Cashton McLeod explains. Uh, it's a white guy's hobby for the most part. Meet Connor Alexander, a member of the Cherokee Nation and tabletop game designer. Uh, I can't count how many times I would see games uh, designed by white people for white people with native or First Nation or indigenous representational themes strapped onto those games. Connor is working hard towards providing more indigenous representation in board game communities. When I started to feel more comfortable in the industry working for distribution and building some contacts within the industry and understanding how it all, how it all worked, I began to think, you know what? I think I actually have something to contribute here that hasn't been seen in this industry. And I wanted Indigenous folks to feel a sense of optimism and hope in this game. Connor created Coyotes and Crows, a role-playing game similar to Vampire the Masquerade or Dungeons and Dragons. The twist, however, is that his game takes place in a decolonized history of North and South America. What I really wanted for my players was a sense of, hey, this is where, where things branched off from our history. And I want you to strip out that colonialism, but then still hold on to your cultural, if you're, if you're indigenous, hold on to your culture and take what's important from your culture and add it into this world. Creating such a world wasn't an easy task. When asked how he went about writing the world within Coyotes and Crows, Connor says, How can I strip colonialism out of this world entirely? I don't want to... I don't want to combat it or deal with it in the game. I don't even want it to be like an opponent in the game. I just want it gone. And I want no mentions of the word Columbus. The word Columbus will not appear in my game. I, I described we were, I described like a spilled cup of coffee, and somebody said, Psst, coffee didn't exist pre-Columbian. There was no coffee pre-Columbian. So it's little things like that that can just slip right underneath there. In Connor's world, players can take on many challenges and play in all sorts of stories based around their cultures from home. So you can have that sort of D&D &D exploration going off into the middle of nowhere and, and finding a strange creature adventure, or you can have a murder mystery set in downtown Cahokia if you want. When asked if we could be given a sneak peek at any upcoming expansions, Connor told us a little bit about the stories of the Freelands. The main thrust of the campaign is um, 10 new stories for Coyote and Crow written by 10 different indigenous authors paired up with 10 artists. And I'm really excited about it. Thanks to Connor, indigenous players like myself have a game we can call our own. Cashin McLeod, APTN National News, Winnipeg. All right, thanks for that, Cashton. If you are interested in Coyotes and Crows, you can support them on Backer IT uh, or visit them on their website for more at www.coyoteandcrow.net. Right, a BC man got a big surprise while walking his dog. Holy shit, you scared the out of me, cat. All right. Mike Anderson captured the moment he stumbled upon a cougar lying on a downed tree. Thankfully, the big cat just watched as Mike and his dog kept walking. Well, that's quite a surprise. Thankfully, no harm was done to anyone involved. All right, that's all we have for you tonight on APTN National News. For more news, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. For all of us here, I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us. Miigwech, and have a great night.